had a terrifying experience last year. I live alone in a smaller house, and I've been living there for three years. It has two bedrooms and just one bathroom, but it's enough space for me. I also have a somewhat small front yard and a fenced-in backyard as well. One Friday night, I got home from work a little early. I didn't have anything going on that night, but was going to hang out with some friends the following day. I decided to do all of my chores right then and there and get them out of the way. There are a lot of chores that I do throughout the week, but also some that I leave for the weekends, like doing laundry and vacuuming the carpet in my house, which is all carpet and a few other things as well. After getting home, I did laundry, vacuumed, and cleaned the bathroom. I also organized a few other things. It only took me like an hour and a half to do everything, and then I was going to cook some food. I had a recipe that I saved on my phone, and I was going to try it. However, I realized then that I couldn't find my phone. Obviously, I didn't have it when I was cleaning and stuff. Normally, I would have left it on the coffee table in the living room, or sometimes on the couch. When I looked in both of those places, though, I couldn't find it. I was not worried until I looked in the entire kitchen, and it wasn't there either. I went into the bathroom, and I checked my bedroom as well, even though I knew it wasn't there. But I looked anyways. After not finding it at all, I wondered if I lost it somewhere at work or something. But then, I remembered that I had my phone shortly after arriving back at my house. I had texted one of my friends, so I knew that it had to be around here somewhere. I took all of the cushions off of my couch, and it wasn't there. I basically turned the entire place upside down, but the phone just wasn't anywhere. This really puzzled me. I did not have a house phone or any other phone, so I couldn't call to see where it was. The last place that I decided to look was the basement. I had an unfinished basement that I really never used. There were all kinds of pipes and beams down there, and I also stored several large boxes and other items. I kept my vacuum down there, but just next to the base of the stairs. So, I had only gone down there earlier just to grab the vacuum and then put it back. Maybe, just maybe, on some slim, crazy chance, it was down there. I mean, I didn't know where else it would be. I turned on the light and then started to head down the stairs. The light did not do a whole lot and only lit up one measly bulb near the base of the stairs. After walking down, I looked on the floor next to the vacuum, but saw nothing. I was about to turn and head back upstairs, but then I heard a noise. I also thought that I saw some movement out of the corner of my eye. It was mostly out of my sight, and also in a darker area of the basement. When I heard this, I stopped and turned to look in the direction of it. That's when I saw a man come into my view from behind a large box. He was really creepy looking, and I honestly couldn't believe what I was seeing. He was a ways away and I was so shocked for a second or two that I didn't know how to react. The man then stood up and actually started walking towards me. I turned and bolted up the stairs like my life depended on it. I made it up to the top and left my basement. Then I slammed the door shut behind me and ran for my front door. I did not stop until I had made it all the way outside. During this, I didn't think at all. It was really all reaction. I just wanted to get out of my house. After leaving, I realized that I hadn't grabbed my keys or anything at all. Obviously, I didn't have my phone, so I couldn't call the police, and I couldn't get in my car either. I also didn't want to go back inside my house, so I ran to a neighbor's. I didn't go next door because I thought the guy might run outside. After me, so instead, I ran several doors down and then knocked on the front door of that house. 
I didn't know who they were, but I just hoped that they would answer. Luckily, after about 30 seconds, they did. I asked them to call the police and then told them what was happening. They agreed to call the police and we both waited on their front step and watched my house. We saw no sign of anybody leaving. I wasn't sure if the guy had already gone out or if he was still inside. The police were really quick to respond though and got there probably within two minutes. I went back over with my neighbor and met an officer there. The police then entered my house as we waited outside. They came out a while later with the same man that I had seen in my basement. He had still been in the house. In fact, he was found hiding in my basement and on him, he had my cell phone in his pocket. I was able to get my phone back, but the whole thing really creeped me out a lot. I'm not sure when or how he got my phone. The only thing that I can think of is that he was already in my house when I got back from work. Then he might have come upstairs without my knowledge, took the phone, and went back down. How he got into the house, and when he got in the house, I also don't know. Maybe I simply forgot to lock my front door, or maybe he entered through a window. There were no signs of a break-in either way. Since that experience, I bought security cameras, and I'm always sure to make sure that my doors are locked. A few years ago, I lost my phone. I just remember that one day, I came home from work and realized that I didn't have my phone on me. I tried to remember where I could have possibly left it, but I honestly had no clue. I worked a pretty normal office job in the city at that time. Also, I would walk several blocks to get to my car and then would drive home. It didn't seem that likely to me that I would drop my phone, but I honestly had no clue. So the next day when I went to work, I looked around my cubicle, hoping that I had left it there. I thought that it had to be there because I hadn't remembered dropping it or any situations where I could have. I guess it was possible though. After searching my desk and around it, my phone was nowhere to be seen. I felt completely dejected and realized that probably meant that my phone was a goner. If I lost it on the city streets or something, it certainly would not still be there. I logged onto my computer to work after that and figured that I would have to buy another phone later. But when I was checking my email, I saw one with the subject cell phone. My eyes lit up when I saw this. Could somebody have found my phone? I clicked on the email and read it. It was short and to the point. Whoever sent it said that they had found my phone and got my contact information from it. They wanted to give me my phone back as soon as possible, but asked me if I could pay a finder's fee of $400. My happiness went. After reading the last sentence, a finder's fee of $400, I really hoped that it was a joke. I responded to the email saying that I would meet them as soon as possible when they were available to get my phone back. I added that I hoped they were joking about the $400. The sender of the email did not give me a name, and it was from a Gmail account with just random letters and numbers. They responded to me within the hour and told me that they were not joking and wanted $400 for the phone. My phone was the newest version of the iPhone, which did sell for a lot more than $400, but I would still rather buy a new phone for more money than give whoever this was the satisfaction. It made me really angry that they thought they could do that to me. I asked to meet with the person and didn't say if I would pay them or not. The person said that they would come by my house that night and asked me for my address. I responded, saying that I would rather meet in public, but they didn't respond to me after that. All of our communication took place within this one workday for me. At the end of the workday, I left and drove back home. But on the way, I stopped at the store and got a cheap phone to use in the meantime. 
I was trying to make up my mind about what I would do. Either I would have to buy a new phone or get this person to be reasonable with me. I thought about offering them $100 or trying to negotiate, but that still made me mad. I know I shouldn't have to pay them any money at all. I also considered getting the police involved, but I didn't know if anything could be done. So I got home that night at like 6 p.m. or so. I lived by myself in a pretty standard one-bedroom apartment. About an hour after returning home, there was a knock on my door. I walked over and looked through the peephole to see who was there. When I did, I saw a man standing outside the door. He was wearing a black jacket, a winter hat, and sunglasses. He was also wearing a scarf that was covering most of his mouth. It was winter time though, so nothing about it was that strange. I realized this might be the guy who had my phone. He likely got my address from my phone as he had gotten my contact information. I opened up the door and said hi to him. I really couldn't tell much of what he looked like because of what he was wearing. But he was a little bit shorter than me. He said that he had my phone and wanted just $400 for it and would give it back to me. Then he reached into his pocket and held my phone up for just a second. I tried to reason with the guy. I asked him why he thought I should give him that much money. He said because he wanted it. I told him that that was unreasonable and it was my phone, so I shouldn't have to pay him. The guy cursed at me and then out of nowhere, started walking forward and into my apartment. I didn't have any time to stop him, and I backed up, but couldn't even try to close the door on him. He was already mostly inside at that point. I just turned and ran for the nearest room, which happened to be my bathroom. I was just a few feet ahead of the guy, but when I started running, gained some distance on him. I got into the bathroom and then slammed the door shut and locked it. The guy tried entering seconds later, and after that, I heard him walk away. He was still inside my apartment though. Luckily, I had my crappy phone that I just bought at Walmart. I dialed 911 as I heard the guy rummaging through my apartment. I told the police what was going on, and I was told that some officers were on the way. Still, I was pretty scared being alone in my place with this creep. I heard him go into my bedroom as well as the living room and kitchen. I hoped that he wouldn't try to enter the bathroom again. And luckily, he didn't. He remained inside my apartment for maybe five minutes, and then I heard him leave. I stayed in the bathroom until the police got there, though they arrived about five minutes after the man left. When I went back out, I saw that my apartment was pretty messed up. The guy was probably looking around for anything valuable that I had, and he did steal a few things. Luckily, my wallet was still on me. I told the police all the information that I could, and they said they would look into it. Unfortunately, I never got my phone back. I still don't know who stole it. I've considered that it was possibly somebody who works in my building that did it. My office building is very large and multiple companies are in there. Lots of people go through the building, so that might be what happened, but I really don't know that for sure. One time, I found a phone on the side of the road. I was driving home later at night, probably around 10 p.m. Things were quiet as I came to a stop at a red light. I casually looked around the intersection that I was at. It was busy during the day, but at night, not so much. I was next to a divider that was to my left, and I noticed something on the ground. It appeared to be a phone. I opened up my door and looked closer, realizing that it was, in fact, a cell phone. So I picked it up. It had been raining outside, so the phone was pretty wet, and I figured it was probably broken. But after looking closer, I saw that it was an iPhone, and I hit the power button, and it actually turned on. After that, 
the light turned green, so I had to finish driving home. But once I was back, I took the phone out and looked at it. Nothing appeared to be wrong with it, and I wanted to return it to the rightful owner. The phone was password protected, though, so I had no clue who it belonged to. I tried 1234 as the passcode and some other obvious ones, but none of them worked. After that, I tried using voice commands. I asked Siri who the owner of the phone was, and she said the phone belonged to Brian. Now I had a name, but unfortunately, it was a pretty common name. I asked Siri for Brian's contact information, but I was told that the phone had to be unlocked for that. That was the same for everything else. I tried a lot of other commands, but didn't get any results. So I only had the one name to go off of. After that, I decided to make a post on Craigslist that I found somebody's cell phone. I described where I had found it and included a picture of it, asking for the owner to get in touch with me. Within a day, I got a reply. The first reply though, was somebody claiming that the phone was theirs. I asked them what their name was, and if they answered with anything other than Brian, I knew it wasn't theirs. The first person didn't want to give me their name and asked me why I wanted to know. I said, because I know the name of the person who the phone belongs to, and I want to make sure that it's you. They responded saying their name was Joe and I knew that they weren't the owner. Sometime later though, I got another reply with somebody saying that it was their phone. When I asked them their name, they said Brian. I finally had found the owner. I was really happy, and I couldn't believe that it actually worked. I asked Brian where he wanted to meet to pick up his phone. Brian told me that he didn't want to cause me any trouble, and he could just stop by my house. When he said that, I thought maybe I shouldn't give him my address. But I told myself, I'm not selling anything on Craigslist. I'm just returning the phone to the owner. So I convinced myself that it was fine, and I gave Brian my home address. He told me that he would stop by at 8 p.m. to pick up the phone. I agreed, and that night at around 8 p.m., house and I couldn't shake off the uneasy feeling. I double-checked all the locks on my doors and windows and decided to stay alert for the rest of the night. The next morning, I woke up feeling a bit uneasy about the encounter with Brian. I checked my security cameras to see if they had captured anything unusual. To my surprise, the footage showed Brian circling my house multiple times, lingering on the front step and wandering into the backyard. This discovery alarmed me, and I decided to report the incident to the police. I provided them with the security camera footage and a detailed description of Brian. They assured me they would look into the matter. Days passed without any updates from the police, and I began to feel a growing sense of unease. I started noticing unfamiliar vehicles parked near my house sometimes, I thought I saw someone watching from a distance. The paranoia set in, and I couldn't shake the feeling that I was being followed. One evening, as I returned home from work, I noticed a car parked across the street. It seemed to match the description of Brian's car. My heart raced as I quickly entered my house and locked the door behind me. I peeked through the window, and indeed, it was Brian sitting in the car, staring at my house. Feeling threatened, I called the police immediately. They advised me to stay inside and assured me they would send someone over. As I waited, Brian remained in his car, occasionally glancing at my house. The police arrived, and as soon as they approached, Brian drove away. The officers took my statement, and they promised to investigate further. However, I couldn't shake off the fear that Brian might return. I installed additional security measures and remained vigilant, constantly looking over my shoulder. The 
following weeks were filled with anxiety and uncertainty. I never knew when or if Brian would resurface. The police couldn't provide concrete evidence of any wrongdoing, and I felt trapped in a state of constant vigilance. As I continued living with this unsettling experience, I couldn't help but wonder what had initially led Brian to my doorstep and what his true intentions were. The mystery lingered, casting a shadow over the sense of security I once had in my own home. As he drove away, he didn't return that night, or at least not to my knowledge. I often find myself pondering about what he might have been up to. My best guess is that he could have been contemplating breaking in, and perhaps the sudden illumination of the lights scared him off when I turned them on. Honestly, I don't have a clear answer. It was just an unsettling experience. This all unfolded just a few months ago. More recently, I went to a nearby park with my friend Mikey. This park, not too far from our homes, offers a variety of amenities like a baseball field, basketball courts, a playground, picnic tables, and large grassy areas. It's quite expansive and we often go there to play sports or just hang out. On this particular day, Mikey and I were engaged in some conditioning exercises at the park. We both play sports regularly and frequent the park. It was getting later in the evening, right around sunset. While the park had some lights, it tended to get quieter after sunset, with most people having already left. As Mikey and I were finishing up, made our way back to one of the park's parking lots. The park had two parking lots, one on each end. It was a bit of a walk, and upon reaching my car, I realized I didn't have my phone. After some thought, I remembered likely leaving it where we had been working out. We had set our belongings down while exercising, and I wouldn't run with my phone in my pocket. Mikey and I retraced our steps heading back to the grassy area where we had been. In the distance, I noticed a guy walking. Initially, I assumed he was merely passing through. However, as he got closer, he looked down near where Mikey and I had been, picked up what seemed to be a phone from the ground, and I recognized it as mine. Determined, I began running towards him, not wanting him to. I sprinted towards the guy, yelling at the top of my lungs, but he didn't stop. He continued walking briskly, and when I closed the distance, he suddenly picked up his pace, transitioning into a sprint. He made a beeline for a car parked in the lot, swiftly got inside, and started the engine. Desperation fueled my legs as I sprinted towards him, but before I could reach him, he peeled away, leaving us in the dust. Frustrated, I turned and sprinted back to my car in the other parking lot, waving Mikey back as he ran towards me. He had witnessed the entire incident. We quickly got into my car, just in time to see the guy driving past our lot. Without hesitation, I started the engine and pulled onto the road behind him, maintaining a safe distance. It was unclear if he realized we were tailing him, but the roads weren't too busy, making it relatively easy to keep up. For about 10 minutes, we followed him until we reached a quiet residential street. He parked in front of a house, and I parked a bit farther away. As he got out of the car, I approached him, yelling once more. This time, he acknowledged me denying any knowledge of the phone and insisting that I leave him alone. He quickly retreated into the house, knowing he was lying. I didn't attempt to follow him inside. Mikey and I approached the front door, and after ringing the doorbell and knocking, the door swung open about 10 seconds later. The guy emerged, wielding a baseball bat, and a woman, also armed with a bat, stood beside him. Fearful for our safety, 
Mikey and I retreated, and they chased us all the way back to the car. I was concerned they might damage my car, so I sped away as quickly as possible. We managed to escape, and Mikey promptly called the police, reporting the entire incident. We parked on a nearby street, waiting for the authorities to arrive. Approximately 10 minutes later, they had moved or left the park. It was unsettling to think that someone might be in possession of my phone, especially in such an eerie setting. I returned home and checked the Find My iPhone app once more. To my surprise, the location now indicated that my phone was in a different part of the city, away from the park. Determined to retrieve my phone, I jotted down the new directions on the back of a post-it note and headed towards the updated location. Despite the uncertainty, I drove for about 20 minutes until I reached the new spot. It led me to a residential area, and the app pinpointed a specific house. Feeling a mix of apprehension and curiosity, I parked my car nearby and cautiously approached the house. As I walked towards the residence, I noticed that the lights inside were dim. A sense of unease settled in as I rang the doorbell. After a few moments, the door opened, and a person who seemed surprised to see me stood there. I explained the situation, mentioning the odd journey my phone had taken through the city. The person, who turned out to be a resident of the house, seemed genuinely baffled and denied any knowledge of my phone. Apologetically, I thanked them and decided to return home once again, feeling frustrated and perplexed. As I reflected on the situation, I couldn't shake off the eerie feeling surrounding the entire incident. It remained a mystery how my phone had traversed from a park to a residential area without any logical explanation. Despite the bizarre turn of events, I eventually accepted the loss and realized the potential risks of pursuing the unknown. This peculiar episode served as a reminder to prioritize safety over possessions, especially when dealing with mysterious circumstances. Myself, leaving the park, the car that had been in the lot began to follow me in the darkness. I couldn't identify the driver, but their actions were unmistakable. They replicated every turn I made, confirming my suspicion that I was being trailed. Curious and concerned, I pondered their motives. I lacked my phone, but I was familiar with the route to the nearest police station. Navigating through the main road, I continued for about five minutes before making another turn. The police station place I passed daily on my way to work, was conveniently located on that road. Upon arrival, I pulled into the station, but the car that had been following me didn't. Seeking assistance, I reported the unnerving incident to the police. Unfortunately, they informed me that there wasn't much they could do. Disheartened but relieved to be in a secure location, I drove home cautiously, checking the location of my iPhone now showed up somewhere else, but shortly after, it disappeared from the Find My iPhone app entirely. The unsettling realization set in that I had to get a new phone. Reflecting on the experience, I acknowledged the potential danger I had unknowingly avoided. While uncertain about the intentions of the person who had my phone, I took solace in the fact that I had acted swiftly by reaching the police station. It was a reminder that even in moments of uncertainty, prioritizing personal safety is paramount. The mystery of the strange events surrounding the loss of my phone served as a cautionary tale, prompting me to remain vigilant and prepared in unforeseen circumstances. The aftermath of that peculiar incident lingered in my mind leaving me with a heightened sense of caution. While I had obtained a new phone, the 
unanswered questions and the mysterious circumstances surrounding the entire ordeal continued to perplex me. Days turned into weeks, and life resumed its normal rhythm. However, a lingering unease accompanied me, especially during nighttime excursions. The awareness that someone had, at some point, possession of my phone without my knowledge kept me on edge. One evening, as I was returning home from work, a sense of paranoia crept in. The winding roads seemed more sinister, and every passing car triggered a momentary surge of anxiety. It was as if the shadows concealed the remnants of that unsettling episode, haunting my journey. As I pulled into my apartment complex, a subtle relief washed over me. I parked, carefully scanning my surroundings before exiting the car. The routine of locking the doors and glancing over my shoulder became second nature. The once mundane actions now carried the weight of a cautionary tale. Time passed, and the incident gradually faded into the background of my life. However, the lessons learned stayed with me, a constant reminder to stay vigilant and prioritize safety. The mystery surrounding the person who had my phone remained unsolved, but the experience had imparted a valuable lesson about navigating the unexpected and being prepared for the unknown. Life moved forward and new chapters unfolded. Yet the memory of that bizarre journey from a park to a residential area and the subsequent pursuit lingered as a cautionary whisper urging me to trust my instincts and prioritize personal safety above all else. In the quiet corridors of memory, the strange tale of the lost phone and the mysterious pursuit became a chapter, both unsettling and enlightening. Life went on, presenting new stories and challenges, but the lessons from that night lingered as a guiding beacon. Over time, the once vivid apprehension began to fade, replaced by a sense of empowerment. I carried with me the knowledge that, even in the face of the unknown, swift action and prioritizing personal safety could make all the difference. The city's heartbeat continued, echoing the rhythms of everyday life. The park, once a scene of eerie discoveries, returned to its role as a peaceful retreat. As for the enigmatic figure who briefly held my phone, they melted into the shadows of the past, leaving behind an unresolved mystery. In the end, the story served as a testament to resilience, intuition, and the ability to navigate through the uncertainties of life. Each experience no matter how peculiar, contributed to the mosaic of lessons that shaped the person I became. The lost phone became a metaphor for the transient nature of possessions, while the pursuit underscored the importance of vigilance and quick thinking. As the chapters of life unfolded, I embraced each one with a newfound awareness, ready to face the unknown armed with the lessons learned from that unforgettable journey. And so, the story closed, leaving room for the next narrative to unfold, guided by the wisdom gained along the way.